By the late 1980s, console games were getting better and better. All my friends either had Nintendos or Segas, and even though I adored my Atari ST, I have to admit, I got a bit intimidated. And when I saw the first glimpses of the new Sega mascot Sonic appear on TV, my jaw dropped to the floor. Those 16-bit graphics and the speed of the gameplay, I had never seen anything like that. Sega! When a friend of mine finally showed me the game on a Sega Master System, I was hooked. All my life, I loved platform games, and this was the absolute pinnacle of the genre. I just had to be able to play it myself. And to solve that issue, I bought a Sega Game Gear. I spent hours on end on that thing. And because of the success of these games, major software houses wanted to jump the hype train, also in the home computer scene. And during the first years of the 90s, we got some amazing platform games on the Atari ST. Most of them were Amiga conversions, and let's face it, the ST ain't no Amiga. We didn't have all those custom chips, but still, the games were great and I was in heaven. Wacky Yin characters like James Pond or the amazing movie license The Addams Family, the fantastic Fire and Ice by Commodore 64 legend Andrew Braybook with his main character Cool Coyote, an actual Sonic lookalike. Gremlin Graphics took it even one step further and released Zool, a fast and furious ninja ant which was promoted as the Sonic beater for the home computer. But in the midst of it all, there was this one title that just didn't get the attention it deserved. And the fact that it was a sequel to a more mediocre PD game didn't really help. Yet it was very colorful, extremely playable and had an absolute console quality feel to it. Today, I want to bring you the complete story of a game I've always loved. This is Doodlebug. Adrian Cummings knew he wanted to make video games for a living from the moment he witnessed those amazing vector graphics in titles like Space War and Asteroids at the Arcades. He was dreaming of buying a NASCOM 2 home computer, but they were too expensive. Eventually, Adrian managed to save enough money to get one of those ZX80 soldering kits, which were sent through mail order. After the Sinclair ZX80, the BBC Micro and the C64 followed. But once the announcements of the new Amiga computer started to appear in magazines, he knew he had to have one. It took forever for the Amiga to reach the UK marketplace, so Adrian bought an Atari ST beforehand. On the ST, he played a lot of Sundog and drew a fair bit with Degas and Neochrome, but it never really clicked. Finally, in the early months of 1986, the Amiga 1000 hit the shelves and he was able to buy one with the aid of a bank loan. It was an expensive thing. Adrian bought the machine at GB Microland, a famous computer shop in Waterlooville. This is where he met Rob Brooks. They became friends and the shop was their hangout place. Together, they decided to work on games. The group of Amiga fanatics grew bigger, with David Bogust joining the team. Over the next years, many game projects were started, most notably the demos for Outlander and Outlander 2, a shoot 'em up series based on the arcade game Star Force. Another one was called City Limits, an 8-way scroller inspired by the arcade racer Cruisin' USA, which would be published by Psygnosis. Remakes of the Commodore 64 classics Beachhead and Raid Over Moscow for US Gold were also planned, just to name a few, but nothing was ever completed or published. In the end, they lacked commitment, and after many failed attempts, the group disbanded. Dave went to university, and Rob got a job at Images Design, converting Wonder Boy and Monsterland for the Atari ST. So by the end of 1989, Adrian made a big leap of faith. He quit his day job and started a career as an independent game maker. He had been working on his own little project for the past months after working hours. It was an ID from his mom. In his new game, you would play as a friendly bug character, clearing up a messy garden and eliminating garden pests. 
his mate Dave came up with an appropriate name for the game. And so, Bug Bash was born. Bug Bash is a cross between a side-scrolling shoot-em-up and a colorful platform game. After 9 months, a working version of the game was ready to go to potential publishers. All he now needed was a company name. Adrian used to sell commercially packaged computer games at a car boot sale on Sundays. And on leaving the venue after packing up for the morning, he spotted an old shoebox with the word MUTATION on the side of it. So he went for mutation software, as everything was seemingly ever changing and mutating from one idea to the next in terms of the games he was looking to create. Finding a publisher wasn't as easy as expected. One day however, while browsing through a magazine, Adrian noticed an advertisement by a publishing company called Microtech. After paying the company a visit, a deal was made and Bug Bash would be published. However, Microtech thought sales would be better on a double pack offering and wanted Adrian to create an extra game. He had witnessed the 32 color parallax scrolling in the System 3 classic Flimbo's Quest and he tried to mimic this effect on his new side scrolling shooter making full use of the Amiga's blitter chip. It took him another 4 months to complete the game, but Nucleus ended up really nice. In the meantime, old pal Rob Brooks was back doing the Atari ST conversion of Bug Bash, as Microtech was also interested in a release for that system. For handing over both games to publisher Microtech, Adrian received a small advance payment. But after that, things went really sour. All contact with the publisher was lost. Adrian called all the magazines that he saw adverts for Microtech games in, only to find out they hadn't been paid either. In a strange turn of events, after releasing the Atari ST version of Bug Bash, Microtech turned into Big Shot software. After endless chasing and a year of no royalty payments, Adrian decided to put rebranded versions of his games into the public domain. He made a small amount of cash, barely enough for cigarettes. His first experience in the game industry was nothing like he had imagined and the event alone totally destroyed his dream of being a game developer in every respect. He ended up in a bad mental place for about 2 years with little to no savings. And Bug Bash represents a dark period in his life where personal friendships were tested to the limits. Adrian had always been a fan of a good platform game. It started very early on during the 8-bit era, with games like Burger Time on the BBC Micro or Bugaboo the Flea on the C64. During his burnout period after the horrible Bug Bash experience, Sega was unleashing some incredible platformers on their new Mega Drive console. Adrian got hooked on Quackshot, Castle of Illusions and Sonic the Hedgehog. Slowly coming out of his bad place on a metric pile of antidepressant, his brain and game imagination started working once again. He programmed a new game concept demo called Vexu Jack. This was the first time Adrian's trademark QC graphic style really stood out. And even though Vexu didn't make it past the demo phase, it would set the stage for something much bigger. By 1992, it was time for something new again. Adrian picked up the main character from Bug Bash again, but this time adorning him with magic pencils so he could draw his way out of trouble. His new title would also be a true platform game. The development of Doodlebug took 10 months and was completely created in Assembler using Dev Pack 2 on the Amiga. Adrian spent hours with good old deluxe paint drawing the sprites and tiles. Of course, all these beautiful sprites had to move on screen. During development, Adrian had a magic moment when Rob showed him software sprite and tile scroll techniques that would change the way he was writing games forever. Building levels using a preloaded set of tiles is a technique still used today. The main advantage is it consumes a lot less memory. And the blitter chip in the Amiga is perfect to copy these rectangular blocks of memory to the screen. Adrian witnessed the fifth bit plane scroll in the game Robocot and wanted to try and mimic this in Doodlebug. The fifth bitplane bitter scroll 
uses the Amiya Blitter Barrel Shifter to scroll the parallax plane of clouds and toys in Doodlebug. But with clever use of the top 16 colors, it's possible to create a bland true effect so the graphics appear in the rear of the screen. He recalls programming this using the Blitter was a mini nightmare. On looking, Rob had a total Eureka moment with pen and paper and it just started to scroll smoothly in parallax at last with a seemingly minor change to the code. And like most things in life, it's not easy until you know how to do it. Robocot was first, Doodlebug did it second. He also wanted to create contour tiles, but they never made it in the final release of the game. When you look at the first level of Doodlebug, you will see 45 degree slopes with steps inserted on them. That is where contour tiles would have been used to create slopes, which Doodlebug could use as a slide. But he just couldn't work out how this was implemented at toad level, so steps were added instead. Eventually, he would pull it off in his next game. Adrian has always considered himself an amateur musician. Playing in numerous bands and having owned a wide variety of hardware synthesizers and keyboards over the years. He loves to write catchy tunes and this is obvious when playing Doodlebug. All the songs were created using tracker tools on the Amiga, like Noise Tracker. By 1992, Adrian had almost finished the game. He sent out a working demo to numerous publishers. Almost instantly, he got a phone call by Jeremy Smith of Core Design. He immediately showed interest and snapped up the game for an Amiga and Atari ST release. After a visit to their offices in Derby, the deal was sealed. Adrian received an upfront check and a guided tour of the company, and the final work on Doodlebug continued, with very little intervention from Core's part. It was fantastic. It was such an uplifting moment in Adrian's life after everything he had been through with the release of Bugbash. And as a side note, Gremlin Graphics, who had also received his Doodlebug demo, turned it down as they said they already had a similar but more advanced game in the pipeline. This game would later turn out to be Zool. The Atari ST conversion was once again done by Rob, but because of the limitations of this machine, some compromise had to be made. For starters, the 5th bit plane parallax was removed. Sound samples were also dropped, freeing up precious memory for the scroll routine. Rob already had an 8-way scroller for the ST he'd written for Super Wonder Boy, so he just used that. The scroll system on the ST uses 3 screen-sized buffers, each shifted by 4 pixels, which are copied down in up to 4 blocks due to the mad wraparound logistics in play. Shifting graphics between 16 pixel boundaries with a 68000 is slow, so you have to keep all those shifted graphics buffered up all the while you need them on screen. If you want to learn more about the scrolling subject, Rob was kind enough to create a separate video explaining the matter in full detail. In the end, the ST version of Doodlebug runs between 3 and 4 screen frames, which is at 12.5 to 17 frames per second. This improves when playing on a Mega STE. One thing the system didn't offer was tile animation. The Amiga redraws the entire screen from tiles with the blitter every refresh, so that makes tile animation really easy with very little overhead. The ST version uses an optimized sprite routine to overdraw any animated tiles, which takes a lot of time if there are a huge amount of animated tiles on screen. The lava tiles in level 3 are a good example. The animated waterfalls of level 4 on the Amiga were replaced by static tiles on the ST. The Amiga version used 16 colors on the main game screen and another 16 on the status bar. But because Adrian used the ST color palette on the Amiga, with the RGB values of each of the 16 main colors on the bitmap graphics only using even values, both versions are identical. For the gradient skies, the timer B interrupt was used so the STE was able to display more colors here compared to the vanilla ST version. Obviously, Doodlebug on the ST may drop out occasionally because it's running pretty tight to the 3 screen frame limit even on the levels which don't have a lot of tile animation and the Amiga version is possibly leaning back more towards 2 screen frames in places which is equal to 25 frames per second. 
But it's worth noting that the Amiga starts off at 7.14 MHz against the SD's 8 MHz. And because the Amiga version uses 5 bit planes, all the while the graphics chip is rastering pixels on screen, the deficit is increased even further. Clearly, the SD is doing a lot of heavy lifting that the Amiga isn't in terms of dealing with software scroll and sprites, which becomes very obvious when comparing both versions head to head. Rob used the same noise tracker data as the Amiga version for the music, redefined the note frequency tables and invented some instrument patches to replace the sound samples. These patches weren't algorithmically driven, so there was no modulation of the chip registers defined by the patches themselves, just a set of values for each register at initialization, which was then just modulated externally by the tracker data on the vertical blank interrupt. The Amiga version used 3-channel music in-game, with a spare channel dedicated to sound effects, which was useful for keeping the music intact all the while there was no sound effect playing on the ST. For sound effects on the ST version, Rob just hijacked one of the music channels and played the noise tracker sequence, which mimicked to a degree what the corresponding effect sample was doing on the Amiga version. The replay routine was mostly what he had used for Bug Bash. By 1992, Doodlebug was released to mostly favorable reviews. There was a lot of stiff competition at the time, which was apparent when reading the magazine conclusions. The game received a nice 83% in Amiga power, stating that it's not really up there with Zoo and the Adams Family, but it's not that far behind either. It reminds me of Fire and Ice, and it's good fun in a not at all the similar sort of way. The game was good, but it lacked originality. Amiga Action gave it a 76%, concluding with the following statement. Stolen IDs left, right and center, addictive gameplay and cute visuals are all part and parcel of Doodlebug. It's a charm to play, just as any other accomplished platform game is, but if I had to spend over £25 to play it, I'd definitely think twice. It's just too uninspiring in the originality department. If the graphics were more sophisticated and it equaled the technical brilliance of Zoo, the choice would be yours. But the bottom line is, there are finer platformers on the shelves. The box art was designed and airbrushed by Brian Lenton, who also created the cover for the game Warzone. When all was said and done, Doodlebug sold between 15 and 20,000 copies on both systems combined, making it Adrian's most successful game on a 16-bit system. What an amazing accomplishment. Adrian's love for the Amiga never truly faded. After Doodlebug, he continued his one-man developer's company and released the Smash TV-inspired Cyberpunks, featuring his trademark cutesy graphic style. In 1996, after playing the game Clockwork Knight on a friend's Sega Saturn, Adrian got inspired yet again. He picked up the Doodlebug engine and enhanced it for his new game Tin Toy his first AGA game for the Amiga 1200. This time, he also published it himself. He did a few more Amiga games, Tommy Gun and Castle Kingdoms, until the system was completely dead. Then he moved on to the PC and mobile market. Doodlebug even got a re-release on the iPad in 2010. Adrian has also written over 80 mobile apps with Krakow Gold Slots being his most successful. With over 1 million downloads on the Android alone, it completely changed his life. These days, he is retired and doing the stuff mostly as a hobby. But in 2020, he decided to return to the Amiga scene. For 11 months, he worked on a new title, again based on the Tin Toy engine and again exclusively for the Amiga 1200. Wiz is a beautiful platform game and even got a special limited big box run. And he's not about to stop just yet, with a new title planned for 2023. It breaks my heart we never got to see more Mutation Soft titles for our beloved Atari systems. But I will always be grateful for the beautiful Doodlebug. And that's it for now. I really hope you enjoyed the show. And remember, stay Atari or, or Commodore. Well, it's all good. Bye. <laughs>